Hey everyone, we're so glad you've joined us. This is Paul and I am Taylor and we are going to give you uh, the scoop on what's happening in and around Sun Valley. Paul, what do you got for us? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the first thing we have I wanna let you know about is our daily devotional. These are two to four minute videos that we actually send out Monday through Friday each and every day to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus and, and maybe start your day, end your day, or get a midday break and just focusing on the words of God. You can sign up for those at daily.sv.cc and they'll be emailed to you or you can actually find all those videos on YouTube. Absolutely, and on YouTube, you can also find our Loving God, Loving People podcast. Um, this is a great opportunity to dig a little deeper into what we talk about on the weekends. Um, it's a conversation that's raw, real, and relevant between Chad and Robert usually. And this is a great opportunity, like I said, to grow in your spiritual walk with Jesus. So you can find that podcast on our app app and um, by going on YouTube. Yeah, our app, as Taylor mentioned, is an incredible resource built for you to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus and even spend a little bit more time daily just in God's words, learning his promises for you. So we have that through reading plans and our daily, our verse of the day. But we also have a media feed full of every message, podcast, and more, so you can find those. And also, we have a weekly guide. So if you're ever wondering what's going on at my campus or what's going on at the church, that is the best place to find it. It's personalized for you if you sign in and also it just might help you find what your next step in following Jesus is so be sure to download that today and we're super excited that just on Friday The Valley that's the worship culture here at Sun Valley released a brand new song called Heaven and Earth we'd love for you to stream it listen to it and be blessed by it you can find it wherever you listen or stream music you can also find it at thevalley.com our parenting courses are launching this week, um, so make sure you sign up because let's face it, kids, it's it's pretty interesting, which means parenting can be interesting as well. So we'd love for you to join us in the six-week course as we walk through some strategies in the Bible to see what God says about how to raise our kids. So you can go to parenting.sv to sign up today. Yeah, and hey, did you know that Easter is only two weeks away? It's crazy. Hopefully Hopefully you have your Easter brunch plans, the family knows you know what you're gonna be doing, but also hopefully you've RSVP'd. We wanna make sure that you and your guests and anybody coming with you has the best experience possible. If you're attending online, we can't wait to see you there, but if you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love to invite you to one of our physical campuses so we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together, the biggest moment in human history. But also, you never know what God might do through a simple invitation. Who are you inviting to Easter this year? We, maybe you can just send a personal text to a friend or a neighbor. Maybe you can share one of our social posts and invite someone to actually come with you. Be sure you can find all of that. You can learn more. We'd love to see you and celebrate with you this Easter. Go to easter.sv.cc. Absolutely, and hey, if you're new with us, we're so glad you're here. Um, but we have a great first step for you, and that's to pull out your phone and text the word NEW to 48,000. You can get connected at Sun Valley as, as much as you want to, yeah. um, because we believe that the church is not a building that you go and sit in, it's a movement that you yeah. choose to be a part of. So go ahead and text the word NEW to 48,000. And later on in service, we're really excited this week, we're gonna actually celebrate communion together. We're gonna receive that, that and have a moment together in our message. So right now, Pause the video and you can actually go get the elements ready. So you can grab some, some bread or a cracker. You can grab some juice and a wine so that you're prepared later to take and partake in that moment with us. Absolutely. And hey, chat's live right now as we speak. So let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what the best part of your week has been. Mm. Or maybe you have something that you need prayer for. We would love to be praying with you um, and connecting with you and having conversations. So go ahead, chat with us live as we speak right now. Yeah, again, we're so glad you're here with us as our service starts right now.
Church, we're so thankful you're here with us today. We're going to celebrate the victories and the battles in our life because they all belong to God. Let's sing this together now. And all I see is the battle. You see my victory. Yes, you do, Lord. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Because there is nothing to fear now. There's nothing to fear now. For I am safe with you. Let's give God all of our praise right now, church. Come on now. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. And I sing through the night. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. There is nothing impossible for our God. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. Heartbroken and grief. 
the mother's pain and the son was lost My dad was paid upon the cross And death was swallowed by triumphant light And darkness defeated by eternal life The battle won his kingdom come We lift our praises high The king of heaven and the earth collide the 
heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. to see how God is going to move in this next season. We've partnered with a very special ministry called Chosen Children Ministries in Nicaragua. And it's the goal to build a hundred homes for those in poverty. We're excited to see how God is going to move in and through Sun Valley to make this possible. So as you have a seat, check out this video. Every Easter we receive a special offering and we give 100% of it away. This year our project is just outside of Managua, Nicaragua, and it's a ministry called Chosen Children. And I sat down with the national director, Guillermo Morales, to talk about the ministry. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've been to different places in Central America. This is my first time to Nicaragua. Okay. What did the volcano mean? Is there historical significance about the volcanoes here? The indigenous people of Nicaragua beloved many things about the land they lived in. Nicaragua is the land of lakes and volcanoes, and both were great forces to be respected. One volcano, which you see, is the Masaya volcano, and they believe it was the very doorway into hell. When times were not good, they would sacrifice women and children into the volcano, a sacrifice they were willing to make in hopes of a better time. Witchcraft is an old world practice that even if you don't believe in it, it can still cause a lot of pain and anguish. No one knows this better than a woman in our Carlos Fonseca congregation. As a young girl in the city of Managua, I had to grow up more quickly than I should have. With an abusive father, I became a victim before I even had the words to describe what was happening to me. My mother blamed me and became jealous of the attention my father was giving me. I didn't want this. With each assault, my mother began to beat me more and more. She even tried to curse me using the witchcraft of the ancestors in hopes of ruining my life. Day after day, my mother would follow me to school with a switch, beating me, chasing me, 
until the very moment I was safe in a class. How can any child thrive with the fear of what you will face once returning home? Parents should provide a safe place somewhere that children feel nurtured. But by the time I was 11, I was kicked out of my home, forced to make my own way in life as a child. Even still, my mother's fire would find me and she would chase me to school and shout curses at me. For years, I wandered the streets homeless, and at 19, I found a church where I heard about God. I would ask God that one day he might give me a home of my own so that one day I could make a safe space for my own children. Shortly after this, I fell in love and became pregnant with our first child. My mother still cursed me, sneaking into my husband's home at night and pouring lemon juice on my hair in hopes that our children would be lost. But God protected me and my children through all four of my pregnancies. To escape my mother and with a growing family, we moved in with my husband's sister in a larger home away from the city. But my sister-in-laws refused to welcome me into their family. They would throw me and our kids outside regularly to spend the night left alone in the rain and the heat and tried to convince my husband that we were not good enough for him. Finally, my husband was convinced and chose his family over our children. He turned against me and together they kicked us out of their house for good. With nowhere to go at 29 years old, with four children to care for, all I could do was beg to God to deliver us from being sacrificed to nature, to spare me and my children's lives from the uncertainty of the next day. God saw me and my children. He cares for the least of these, and we were viewed as the very last. The people in our communities that would normally be discarded, He rescues us from the gates of hell. And so God answered my prayers. The community leaders gave us a vacant plot of land to call my own. Chosen Children Ministries heard about our story through church and was able to build us a house that will become our permanent home. This house looks plain, but in a place with so much need. This home provides us everything we could ask for to thrive. With a locked door to keep my family safe, a dry place to sleep to keep my family from getting sick, and a supportive church community that looks out for each other so that I can earn a living, this house represents a break in the cycle of poverty. This land, whose fire has been used to strike fear in the hearts of the most vulnerable, is now a place of joy, a place of wonder, a place of hope. Well, what an incredible story. And we are so excited this Easter season to be partnering with Chosen Children Ministry to join in the work that God's already doing in and through the communities in Nicaragua. So if you wanna to give today and help be a part of transforming families and helping them find the hope in Jesus that they can have, go to give.sv.cc. And hey, if this is your first time with us, welcome, we're so glad you're here. This is Taylor and I'm Paul. Yeah, and since you're new here, we have a great first step um, for you to take today, and that's by pulling out your phone right here, right now, and texting the word NEW to 48000. We believe here at Sun Valley that you can be as connected as you would like to be. So I would like to invite you to go ahead and text the word NEW to 48000. And hey, if you wanna grow in your relationship with Jesus, and if you wanna spend more time maybe building a habit of reading the Bible, God's Word, each and every day, be sure to download our Sun Valley app. In it, we've got a daily reading plan with a verse of the day that'll help you grow and learn God's promises for your life. Also, we have a media feed full of messages, devotionals, podcasts, and articles that are gonna help you grow in your relationship and understanding of who God is. And also, we have a weekly guide that helps you understand what's happening at your campus and maybe what your next step in following Jesus may be. Be sure to download the app today wherever you download apps and also follow us on social media. We're at Sun Valley CC. Parenting course starts this week, so you're definitely gonna wanna sign up because let's face it, kids, 
They can be interesting, they can be unique, you never know what you're gonna get. But hey, you're not alone, so we would love to invite you to walk alongside us as we go through our parenting course. This will be a time where you get to learn strategies um, and connect with other parents and just dig into what God's Word says about raising our kids. So you can sign up by going to parenting.sv.cc. Yeah, and Easter is two weeks away. And make sure that you've RSVP'd for the service that you're going to attend and be a part of. But remember this, hey, Easter is actually one of the times, the easiest times of the year to invite someone to church. And so maybe you can send a personal text to a coworker inviting them to come to service with you. Or go onto our social media platforms, find and share one of our posts and tag a friend. And while you're at it, maybe if you're in the Phoenix area, you can actually stop by one of our campuses and grab an invite card and use it to start a conversation with a neighbor. Remember, you never know what God might do through a simple invitation. Learn all about everything that's happening this Easter at easter.sv.cc. We're so glad you're here as we continue our series, King and Cross. Good to see you again. <sighs> Remembering is important, right? I've learned this the hard way because <laughs> is remembering people's names a challenge for anyone else? Okay, have you actually in the past years said the phrase, I'm just bad at names? If you've said that quote, just go ahead. Yes, perfect. Gonna call you out, so just keep those hands raised. Yeah, yeah, this one's for you. Um, so I said that thinking it was socially acceptable too right? I recently did. I, I was with, <laughs> with these people and I was like, oh, and I said like, oh, what was that name again? After, you know, the fourth time she shared it with me. And then uh, and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm just bad at names. And she goes, no, um, no you're not. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> she said, you're just not prioritizing them. <laughs> I know. She, the truth is she wasn't wrong, but she also wasn't nice. So... <laughs> So what the mean lady told all of us is, turns out, uh, you can get better with names if you just stop using that excuse, and I'm not going to let you interact with that lady ever, so I'll just tell you in a nice way. Like, turns out we can prioritize that, and with just a little bit of, a little bit of effort, I've been surprised at what I've found. You can remember, and remembering is incredibly important. I'm presently back in school. And I recently had to do something called a life map. And what a life map is, is you basically spend all this time writing out every memory, positive or negative, you can remember about your whole entire life. <laughs> you write them all out, each on an individual sticky note. So you have like hundreds of memories. Then you spend the next hour uh, putting them all in chronological ordering and changing the color. All the positive ones that have influenced you for the good go a certain color. And all the ones that have been more challenging, you put in a different color. You put in chronological order, then you base it based on chapters of your life. And then you have your story before you. Anyways, we're gonna do that at the end of this service, so I hope that your um, <laughs> sticky notes on your way out. You grab communion on the way in, on the way out, just sticky notes. No, but here's what I'll tell you. I'll just tell you the one thing I learned the most that surprised me. Success is limited in its ability to grow you. It's all the pain stuff. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish you did something great, you were successful, and then you just grew and became better as a result. Just a few days ago, I preached a message on grief, and I came to Ecclesiastes 7 that said this awful thing. It says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, because death is the destiny of man, the living should take this to heart. Blech. <laughs> it's better to go to a house of crying than to a house of feasting. It's better to remember that. Here's why it was so impactful for me and why I think that that's actually true, why it's better. Not more comfortable, that's for sure, but why is it better to remember hard things? Why is it better to remember? Here's why it's better. Because weddings are fun, funerals are impactful. 
It makes you think about your life. As we've been in this series, we're continuing it, but we're coming to the end of Jesus' life here on earth. This is Holy Week. Welcome. <laughs> if you're new with us, welcome to Holy Week. We're here, and he's going he's gonna to call us to remember. Jesus is going to call us to remember. And he's not just going to call us to remember at once. He's going to actually create a way for us to remember forever. <laughs> And that's what we read about. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. If not, we're going to have it projected on the screen. If you cannot read good news, I can. We are set. Mark chapter 14 is where we're headed as Jesus compels us to remember to look back because it's, it matters. It can impact us for the better. We're going to look at how it impacts us for the present. And then we're going to anticipate the future with hope. I have good news. You guys ready for it? Perfect. Mark chapter 14 says this. Beginning in verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not Drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day, now he's talking about the future, when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Will you pray with me? Father, I... I pray that you would make these words sink deep into our lives, that we would not just know them in our heads, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would go deep. And for people that are confused, I pray that you would bring clarity. People that feel frantic about their life or feel like I just have to do enough, be enough, I pray that you would relax them. And I pray, Lord, by the power of your spirit that you would make peace with people tonight because of the bread and the cup and what it represents. Would you do this, Lord, we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Here's our three movements. We're gonna look back in the past, present, and future. First, the Lord's Supper remembers the past. Let's go back, verse 22. While they were eating, what were they eating? Verse 12, 10 verses earlier, gives us a clue. It says this, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So what they're eating in our text for today is the Passover. Passover is a yearly meal that the Israelites did yearly to remember their delivery, their deliverance from Egypt. Do you remember back in the book of Exodus? If not, let me remind you. The Israelites were enslaved underneath the Egyptians and God tells Moses, justice is coming. And here's something you're going to hear throughout this entire message. Sin, which is basically missing the standard of perfection. Even if you think yours is little, you still missed it big. Because there's a standard and it's perfect. Justice is coming. God does not ignore sin. Do you know this? Some people that kind of hear about Christianity, they go, oh, they just, they just don't even think about sin. Or, or you do think about it, but it's just, it's paid. It's not been paid. No, no, no. God doesn't ignore it, ever. In fact, when God tells Moses to go, he's saying justice is coming. And the thing that surprised me as I was studying this afresh was this, 
that when he said that justice is coming, he didn't say that the justice was only for the Egyptians. He didn't say only the Egyptians would not be hit. See, the world is not divided between good people and bad people or better people and worse people. Because if the world was divided like that, guess what? Us and everybody else would all be on the bad side. <laughs> That's the truth. So he says justice is coming for all sin for all time. And so what he does in order to deliver his people from slavery is he sends these plagues to come down. And when you get to the 10th plague, the 10th plague is God doing these miraculous acts to say, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, that would be, that's like the, <laughs> read it, Exodus, good luck. Okay, so, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Remember, Moses goes, let my people go. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And Pharaoh said, no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they're like a couple plagues. Pharaoh's like, just kidding. You can take them. And then he's like, just kidding again. No. And then the plagues. No. Plagues, plagues. Go back and forth, back and forth. Then you come to this most serious of all, and they're all anticipating. They're all building this one really big moment. The death of the firstborn son. Whew. And here's what God tells Moses to do. He says to tell my people, the only way that they can survive is if they kill a lamb, if they eat it that night and they put the blood of that lamb on their doorposts. As justice comes, it is only if you take shelter under the blood of the lamb will you survive and have hope. That night, in every single home of Egyptians and Israelites, there was either a dead son or a dead lamb. The only way that you would survive is if you took shelter under the blood of a substitute, someone or something, an animal to die in your place, and it was then that death passed over them. That's how it gets its title, the Passover. You are saved not because of your goodness, but on your faith and trust in that sacrifice to save you. Jesus, when he, in Mark chapter 14, begins this Passover meal, they were familiar. And each aspect of that meal that they had celebrated every single year since the delivery from Exodus, from Egypt, Every year since, what happens is there's a presider and he would bless all the different elements and then he'd explain the symbolism and say, remember, remember how powerful God is. Don't forget, remember. And he would say things like, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the wilderness. This, this wine represents the blood under which we are saved. And there he's all referencing back and all of them would sit there and they would remember the aspects of both captivity, of deliverance, of wandering in the wilderness, their entire journey they were called to remember. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus didn't just pick some random night to celebrate this Passover or to celebrate what we refer to as the Last Supper. As the Passover meal is observed, the night before God redeemed Israel from Egypt, the Last Supper in Mark 14 is observed the night before he goes to the cross. Jesus, though, changes up the wording. And in this moment, everyone recognizes a change because they had done this their entire lives. They know what the bread represents. They know what the, what the juice represents. They know it. But listen to what Jesus does to switch up the words. Verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave thanks to his disciples. And here's what he said. Take it. This is my body. What? Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is not some lamb, my blood. I've read this account in all the different gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John's is a little unique. I've read all of them. And while there's all this tradition to what a typical Passover meal would have at the table, this is a unique one in so many moments. Not only does Jesus then suddenly put himself into the symbolism, something is happening because none of the gospels talk about or make mention of the main course, the meat. There is no mention of a lamb at this Passover. There was no lamb literally on the table because the lamb of God was sitting at it. 
This, by the way, is why his cousin John introduces him as, here comes the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Not only does the Lord's Supper help us to remember the past, he's also telling us something about the present. Because the same thing that is true about the present for them is true for us today. Look with me on verse 24. It continues, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Number two, the Lord's Supper not only remembers the past, the Lord's Supper is communion with God in the present. In fact, the word, another word we use for the Lord's Supper is communion. It comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which describes the cup as a participation in the blood of Christ, or the bread as a participation in the body of Christ. And by the way, this word participation translates the Greek word koinonia. Maybe you recognize that one. It means this, communion or fellowship. This Lord's Supper is an act of fellowship and participation with Jesus and also with one another. It's highly relational. It's kind of like a meal. Have you ever noticed that when you get a din dinner invitation, it's not just come over and enjoy the food. It's communion with the people. And this is where Christianity does differentiate with other different faith traditions. Catholicism believes in the real presence. Their term is the transubstantiation. So you go ahead and try that one real fast. Basically, it's, it's a little bit misleading, but what they believe, Catholics believe that Christ is physically present in the bread. Now, Reformed theology does believe that Christ is present. They just believe he's spiritually present through the Holy Spirit, not in the literal elements, but kind of behind or in the midst of and as we commune with. This is the invitation. Because every other time, if you read through these gospel narratives and you have Jesus, he's always visiting someone else's home. Someone else is always doing all of that. See, in this one, this is, this is Jesus actually, he's the one that's bringing the food. He's bringing the feast. He's the one that's initiating. He's the one that's making the invitation. But how is this possible? Because what I just said is that the Lord's Supper is communion with God in the present. And I gotta tell you something. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve to be invited. That's something that I just want us to sit with for a second. Elsewhere in scripture, it says this about us making any sort of mistake. It says that the wages or the earning, the wages earning of our sin, what we earn is death, not just physical death, which wasn't a part of God's original intent in Genesis 1 and 2. It's a result of this fall but not just physical death, but also a spiritual death, a separation from God. So let me just tell you and maybe remind you, or maybe you hear this for the very first time, us and our lives and our selfishness and our pride and everything else that we do to make this life all about us, which by the way, culture applauds and is only feeding it to be more and more about us. All of that tells us that this life is about us and we deserve everything good that we get. This is a hard truth. What we deserve is to be very far from a holy and a perfect God. See, I can say these cool truths like the Lord's Supper is communion with God in the present and then you can write it down and you can think about it and be really grateful for it, but here's the reality, we don't deserve that. How is that even possible? How is it possible for us to be with God? And the way that it's possible is because in verse 24, he says this is, my blood of the covenant. Jesus makes a covenant. A covenant is a promise, a promise between God and us. It's a promise of relationship. But notice what the basis of the covenant is. This is my blood of the covenant. I realize this is a heavier passage. <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's better to remember the hard things <laughs> Not always easier, but always better. See, look in verse 25, he says this, truly I tell you, Jesus again speaking, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When you say I'm not gonna eat or drink something until something happens, what you're saying is you're communicating, this will happen. I'm not even gonna eat, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna do anything until this comes to pass. 
Jesus is saying, I will make this happen, this relationship between you and God, I'm making it possible. I'm gonna do this even if it kills me. Now in this day and age, to make a covenant, it involved blood. It involved killing an animal, taking it, cutting it in half, putting the pieces side by side, and then the two parties walk through it. That's how to make a covenant or a promise in this day and age. And what you're doing in walking through cutting a covenant is you're saying, do to me what you've done to these animals if I break my part. In Jesus making a covenant by his blood, he's communicating an unconditional covenant. He will not do, he will not eat or drink until this comes to pass. But something that's shocking about this is typically when covenants were made, it was always the inferior making it to the superior. I will do it, I will do it. Okay, I will do this, I promise. I promise that I will do this and they will cut a covenant. And, and if, if I break my promise, then I, then I promise I will do this. And here's the difference. It is God himself making a covenant to us. And what God himself is saying is, if you break the covenant, if I break the covenant, it's on me, I'm taking it all. This is based on my blood and it's not based on your effort and I need you to hear this. This is one of the most, this is gonna maybe surprise you, relaxing truths of our faith because what it means is this, salvation is not dependent upon your commitment to not break a promise to him. It's based on his promise to never break a commitment to you. To make it possible for you to be in a relationship with a holy God. And yet he knows that we'll all break the promise. Who's the promise for? Did you notice what he said in verse 27? You'll all fall away. It's for all of us. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do every time I read the word all is have you all look at each other and say this, neighbor. Thank you. Again, we're, we're warming up. At some point, we're gonna get there and we're gonna get there together and it's gonna be all of us and we're gonna grow together because neighbor, I am so glad. Ready? Uh, that you're as messed up as I am. <laughs> People are like hugging. <laughs> yeah, and now turn to your second choice and say the same thing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All. Oh, you're done. We're done. We're done. <laughs> and I think we've all felt the effects of falling away, haven't we? Of our choices of forgetting a holy God who loves. And I love Peter's arrogance, not me. He's like, actually, you're gonna screw up three times, not just once. <laughs> not me. And I'm so thankful that this covenant promise is not based on me. You know what else it's not based on? It's not even based on the size of your faith. It's just based on faith on trusting just as the Israelites did way back in Exodus, that there's a substitute that, that I can come underneath and find shelter underneath. D.A. Carson wrote this amazing, amazing imaginary story back in Exodus, back in that original narrative of when God's gonna rescue his people from, from Egypt. And he writes this like kind of fake narrative of two fathers having a, having a conversation before that night. And the two of them are standing there and the one's really nervous. And he's like, he looks at the other one. He's like, this is crazy. <laughs> and the other confident guy is like, what do you mean crazy? And the nervous guy's like, dude, I mean, I, I mean like, did you, you've seen all the crazy like plagues that have happened, right? And the death of the firstborn, this is, this is nuts. I'm terrified. The other guy's like, no, I believe in God. We're fine. You did the blood thing, right? He's like, yeah, I'm not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. Of course I did the blood thing. I did like the, the blood on the doors. We did the Passover. We're all packed and ready. We're like, of course, I'm not an idiot. I, didn't, I did the thing, <laughs> but I'm terrified. The other guy's like, I'm not. I know God. He does what he says. Doesn't break his promise. The other guy's like, I know God. But you have three sons. I only have one son. <laughs> I'm terrified. Now here's the question D.A. Carson poses. He says, which of those fathers lost their son that night? The answer is neither. It's not the amount of faith that you have, it's who you have faith in. 
It's not the size of your faith. Is the Lord growing us in that? Yes, and as we humble ourselves, I believe he gifts us more. It's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the object of it. And Jesus in this last meal is taking the narrative that they've always remembered of the past and he's saying, look right here, there's a new covenant. There's a new promise being made, a new way for you to be in a relationship with the holy God and it's completely based on my blood. See, because we all fall short and this is why Jesus came. Jesus, fully God, fully man, knew that we couldn't get to God on our own. Because with one sin, we fall away. Because suddenly, holiness is, is infinitely far with one sin. And because God knew that we could not, in our own effort, get to him, he came to us. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's trusting that even on our best day, we're not good enough to be in relationship based on our best day. And so he sent, because the only one to live up to God's perfect standard is God. So God sent himself, fully God, fully man, Jesus. And he walked around this earth and he lived a perfect life, the life you and I haven't. And in this night, he's saying, and here's what it's all for. I'm gonna make a way not to just cover your sin. I'm gonna make a way for it to never keep you from God ever again. See, when Jesus goes to the cross, he is taking that which we deserve. That's death. The wages of our sin is death. He is taking on himself that which we deserve and he goes to the cross. See, because like I said, sin is not ignored. The addictions are not ignored. What happened to you when you were young is not ignored by our God. It has to be absorbed somewhere. It's kind of like maybe some of you have given forgiveness to someone who really didn't deserve it. And if you notice that when you forgive someone, there's the potential that they kind of start f f doing well all of a sudden. And what are you doing? You're feeling the effects of it. I wish that when you forgave someone, you just felt, you do, you do feel peace. You do feel better. You get to participate in what God's up to in the world, kind of looking like Jesus, because that's what he does to us. And you get to forgive someone. But have you noticed that when you forgive someone, you still have to absorb it? Because pain, sin, death, is not ignored by our holy and loving God, but it's absorbed by our holy and loving God. When he goes to the cross, he took it all. David Platt wrote it really eloquently when he wrote this. If you're up for it, you could even close your eyes for me. That's helpful. He said this, we are not saved from our sins because Jesus was falsely tried by Jewish and Roman officials sentenced to Pilate, by Pilate to death. What? No, 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 neither are we saved because Roman persecutors thrust nails into the hands and feet of Jesus and hung him on a cross. Do we really think that the false judgment of men heaped upon Christ would pay the debt for all of our sin? Do we think that a crown of thorns and whips and nails and a wooden cross and all the other facets of the crucifixion that we glamorize are powerful enough to save us? Picture Christ in Gethsemane, that's just after this night, as he kneels before his father, Drops of sweat and blood fall together from his head. Why is Jesus in such agony and pain? The answer is not because he's afraid of crucifixion. He's not trembling because of what the Roman soldiers are about to do to him. Since that day, countless men and women in the history of Christianity have died for their faith. Some of them were not just hung on crosses, they were burned there. Many of them went to their crosses even singing. One Christian in India, while being skinned alive, looked at his persecutors and said, I thank you for this. Tear off my old garment, for I will soon put on Christ's garment of righteousness. As he prepared to head to his execution, Christopher Love wrote a note to his wife saying, today they might sever me from my physical head, but they can never sever me from my spiritual head. That is Christ. As he walked to his death, his wife applauded while he sang of glory. Did these men and women in Christian history have more courage than Christ himself? Why was he trembling in that garden, weeping and full of anguish? We can rest assured he was not a coward about to face Roman soldiers. Instead, he was a savior about to, here it is, endure 
divine wrath. Why? Because God's not okay with sin. Listen to his words. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. The cup is a reference to a wood is a reference to a wooden cross, is not a reference to a wooden cross, but divine judgment. It's the cup of God's wrath. This is what Jesus is recoiling from in the garden. This cup is what he holds before them. All God's holy wrath and hatred towards sin and sinners stored up since the beginning of the world is about to be poured out on him and he's sweating blood at the thought of it. What happened at the cross was not primarily about nails being thrust into Jesus' hands and feet, but about the wrath due your sin and my sin being thrust upon his soul. Sin is never ignored, it's absorbed. And in that holy moment, all the righteous wrath and justice of God due us came down on him like like a torrent. Some say God looked down and could not bear to see the suffering that the soldiers were inflicting on Jesus, so he turned away. I wonder if God turned away because he could not bear to see your sin and my sin on his son. One preacher described it as if you and I were standing a short hundred yards away from a dam of water, 10,000 miles high, 10,000 miles wide. All of a sudden, the dam is breached and the torrential flood came crashing toward us and right before it reached our our feet, the ground in front of us opened up and swallowed it all at the cross. Jesus drank the full cup of the wrath of God. And when he had down the last drop, he turned the cup over and cried out, it's finished. This is the gospel. The just and loving creator of the universe has looked upon us hopelessly sinful people trying our best and he sent his son, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross and to show his power over sin in the resurrection so that all who trust in him would be reconciled to God forever, so that all who put their faith and trust, not in their ability to get to God, but trusting that he came to them, died died the death they deserve, would be saved. Saved from a life without God, Jesus experienced everything we deserved so that we would never have to endure it so that we would never have to live this life without him. He made a way. The Lord's Supper is communion with God in the present, made possible because of the body and blood of Jesus, sacrificed for our behalf. Thanks be to God. And it's not just for salvation also our sanctification because suddenly it's not us trusting in our commitment to him. It's just going, oh Lord, I trust you. I trust that you're enough. And if you did believe this, can I tell you what it would do in you? It would relax you because suddenly it wouldn't be based on your performance anymore. Anyone else a little bit tired of this whole performance game? And you hear it all the time, and it's really subtle. It's stuff like this. Here's what you can be free of. It's stuff like this. I just need to pray more. Oh, I, just, I just need to read my Bible more. What are we saying in that? If I just perform a little bit more, then I'll be closer to God. Friends, because of what Jesus did, the moment you put your faith and trust in God's, God's finished work on the cross, it's not about you getting to him. It's about him coming to you, dying the death you deserve, rising to give us life, which proves that he can make anything dead alive again. And when you put your faith and trust in that, it can relax you because suddenly none of it, even your growth is not dependent upon you. It's simply opening up your life to participate with what he's already done. And how do we do it? Jesus tells us how. Remember. It's already finished. Remember. And then participate in his life. Participate in it. Commune with him. Hang out with him. Because if you commune with him, here's what you'll find. Forgiveness yet again. (laughs) Here's what you'll find. Love. He's saying, remember, hang out with me because you're gonna be hanging out with the one who loves you the most because the one who loves you the most doesn't love you based on your good and on your bad. He just loves you. And this is the beauty is that not only is communion reminding us of the past, it's also communing with him in the present. It also is a foretaste of the future. You wanna know what's so great about the Lord's Supper for me is it's a foretaste of the Lamb's Supper that he talks about in Romans chapter 19, Romans, Revelation chapter 19. And when he gives us a taste of heaven, and I think about heaven a lot. 
And here's what I know, that all of our greatest longings in this world, all of the longings of your heart will be satisfied the day you sit down for that eternal feast. And as you take the Lord's Supper, would you just hear God say in your heart, no matter how awful your life feels, I'm unconditionally committed to getting you there. Remember how. It's not your performance. It's mine. It's a foretaste of the future. And as I've studied heaven quite a bit, I was reminded just today of what I think is going to be the best moment. Here's what I think it's going to be. I don't know this from scripture. I just think I know this. <laughs> because these truths that I'm going to say are found all throughout scripture. And when I think about heaven, it's just everything being together as we commune with God. Here's what it's going to be. You and your entire life, every thought, every word, every deed, every attitude you've ever had, every judgment about other people, every sin, everything you've done in the darkness, every terrible relationship that you've allowed yourself to go too far in, everything will be laid bare. And I believe in that moment, as you're with God himself, you will feel so loved, more love than you've ever felt in your whole entire life and you'll be fully known. Why I think that is Jesus telling us who he is. I'm the light of the world. I know everything. I'm the good shepherd. I want to I pastor your heart. I know all he's omniscient, omnipresent, all the omnis. And in heaven we'll be with him. We'll be sitting down at a feast. And friends, it will be a celebration. It'll be a wedding, not a funeral. And I look forward to that day. And each time we embrace in the bread and the cup, we get to remember not just what God has done in our life, also what God is doing here and now, because it's not up to you. Simply open up your life and give it to him. He will do a mighty work through you. He will reconcile and make peace between you and a holy God, and his blood proves it. And he'll give you a foretaste of what's to come. I'll end with this. <laughs> R.C. Sproul Jr. wrote a blog <laughs> after the passing of his wife. And obviously, many of you know why this is personal for me. And here's what he said. My deepest regret is I did not hold her hand more. <laughs> it's not, of course, that I never held her hand. It's likely that I just didn't do it as often as she would have liked. Holding her hand communicates to her in a simple yet profound way that we're connected. Taking her hand tells her, I'm grateful that we are one flesh. Taking her hand tells me, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It's a liturgy. An ordinary habit of remembrance to see more clearly the extraordinary reality of two being made one. I, it would have even in the midst of a disagreement of a moment of struggle it would have communicated we're going to get through this together I will not let go holding her hand more would have communicated to us both my own calling to lead her in our home hand holding is a way to say both you're safe with me and follow me into the adventure it would have reminded me that there's no abdicating no flinching in the face of responsibility and as I lead it, would be a constant anchor, a reminder that I will, I lead not for my sake, but for hers. <laughs> Holding her hand more also would have spoken with clarity to the watching world. It would have said, there's a man who loves his wife. It saddens me that so many only learn this after their wife is gone. Perhaps most of all, however, I wish I had held her hand more so that I could still feel it more clearly. I wish it had been such a constant habit that even now my hand would form into a hand-holding shape each time I get in the car. I wish I could fall asleep feeling her hand in mine. I know all this happily because I did hold her hand. I received all the blessings I described above. I just wish I received them more. It costs nothing and bears dividends even to this day. If for you, it's not too late, make the investment. Hold her hand every chance you get. You won't regret it. It's a powerful picture of how the Lord's Supper works because like holding hands, the Last Supper is the embodiment of a different covenant. 
relationship. Tim Chester rewrote that article and said it about communion. He inverted some of the statements because we're the bride and Christ is the husband, and he writes this. My deepest regret is that I've not partaken of communion more. Or rather, that I've not given it the significance it deserves. It's not that I never took communion. It's likely I don't often, just not as often as Christ may have liked. Communion communicates in a simple yet profound way that we're connected. In communion, Christ tells me, I'm glad that we're one flesh. In communion, Christ says to me, you are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It's a liturgy, an ordinary habit of remembrance by which I see more clearly the extraordinary reality of two being made one. It's a means by which even in the midst of a disagreement or a moment of struggle, Christ communicates to me, we're gonna get through this together. I will not let go. It also communicates to me his calling to lead me. Communion is a way for him to say both, you're safe with me and follow me into the adventure. It reminds me that he will not abdicate or flinch in the face of responsibility as he leads me. Communion is a constant anchor, a reminder that he's not leading for his benefit, but for mine. Taking communion more would speak of the clarity, speak with clarity to the watching world. It would say, there's a person who loves the savior. Perhaps most of all, however, I wish I had taken communion more so that I would feel the gospel more clearly. I wish it had been a constant habit that even now my life would form into a gospel shape throughout the day. I wish I could fall asleep feeling my life in his life. I know all this happily because I have taken communion. I've received all the blessings I describe above. I just wish I had received them more. It costs me nothing and bears dividends even to this day. If for you, it's not too late, make the investment, take communion, receive it with meaning every chance you get, you won't regret it. Church family, you have the elements before you. Hear the words of our Lord. This is my body. Take it. Don't just know about it. Take it. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ's body for us. Let's partake together. He also took the cup, his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins, all sin for all time, never ignored, fully absorbed at the cross of Christ on our behalf. Do this in remembrance of me, Christ's body poured out for us. Let's partake together. Oh, Father, would you help us remember and even relax? You've paid it all. You've paid it all. This is really good news. You've paid it all. Would you free us from trying to prove our worth, trusting that you sought enough to love us to go to the cross? Thank you for making a way. I pray for those in the room that have never put their faith and trust in you and have simply put their faith and trust in themselves. That, Lord, you'd help them remember, and I ask that by your spirit, you'd give them faith to believe you, that you did this for them. Help us, Lord, we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Hey, what an incredible service. I hope you were able to walk away with something that you can take into the week with you. And I'd love to invite you back as we continue our series, King and Cross, and I'll see you next week. Bye.